morning, church. Well, it's a joy to be in God's presence this morning to see beautiful faces, and we're grateful to God for the good weather. I will be filling in for Pastor Jeff today, as already mentioned in the prayer. Um, he came down with COVID, and we'll pray for, keep them in our prayers, pray for our pastor, pray for Cindy, that God will bring them back to full health and restore strength to them. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Kelechi Christopher Uchebu. I've been in IBC for over two years now, and I will be standing in for Pastor Jeff, like I already mentioned. Would you please pray with me as we go into God's word? Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you for this privilege this morning to feed at your table. We pray, Lord, that everyone will have their hearts open. We pray that you anoint our hearts, anoint our ears, and our minds to receive your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit will minister to each and every one of us. We pray today, Father, that as your word comes forth, may your word come forth with grace. Speak through me, Lord, today. Let me speak as your oracle and minister with the ability which you give. I thank you, Father, for this, and I bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'll be speaking on the subject, the blessing of righteousness. And my opening text will be from Job chapter 25, verse 4, and it reads, How then can man be justified with God, or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Romans chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 say, Saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. The revelation of the righteousness of God was revealed to us according to Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Paul, speaking by the Spirit of God, said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to those that believe, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For in that gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, this revelation of the righteousness of God is not just um, a revelation that God is righteous. Because the revelation of God being a righteous God predated the gospel of salvation in Christ Jesus. In the Old Testament, you have um, the revelation of God being a righteous being. He's a righteous person. But this revelation of the righteousness of God as revealed in the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 17 is the righteousness that God imparts to the believer when he or she places his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's the righteousness that it's talking about here. And so we see that this righteousness is what makes man to be able to have fellowship with God? Why is righteousness important? To know why righteousness is important, we have to go back to the book of Genesis. Man was made to have fellowship with God. That was the reason why God made man. He wanted to have fellowship with man. But when sin came, spiritual death accessed the spirit of man. And man no longer had the freedom and the courage to come to God. In Genesis chapter, nine verse, chapter, chapter 3 verse 10, it reads, And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. The voice that once gladdened Adam's heart now struck fear into his heart. Something had gone wrong. Adam suddenly had a sense of inferiority, a sense of sin consciousness, 
a sense of unworthiness. He could no longer come to the one he once adored. Because sin had caused a separation from the Lord. And so God had to work out a plan to restore man back to fellowship. And that plan is the plan of redemption. Now, why is righteousness important? Righteousness is important because man cannot have fellowship with God until righteousness is given to him. The feeling of unworthiness and inferiority, fear, must be taken away from his heart. That thing that made him run away from God when he heard God's voice needs to be eradicated from his spirit. Otherwise, he would not be able to come before God and enjoy fellowship with God. There can be no perfect fellowship in an atmosphere of fear. It's impossible. And so righteousness becomes important for fellowship to exist. So God works out a plan, his redemptive plan. And God's, and even though fellowship had been broken, God still maintained relationship. Now let's take the, the case of a, a child and a father. Sometimes children do things that displeases their parents and they may not be on talking terms for some time. Fellowship is broken, but relationship still exists. The child does not cease to be the, the, the child of the parents because, um, because fellowship had been broken. Relationship remains, but fellowship can be broken. God needed to do something about this broken fellowship. And that was why he came up with his plan of redemption. So God was still in touch with man. You read the story of Cain and Abel and how God talked to Cain. Where is your brother Abel? There was still some form of contact with man. Interestingly, in Abraham, in Genesis chapter 15 verse 6, 5 and 6, God brought Abraham. He said, and the Lord God called Abraham abroad and said to him, look toward the heaven. Tell the stars if you can number them. This is how your seed will be. The sixth verse says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. God now gives us a template of the kind of righteousness he wants to offer man. And it is called the righteousness of faith. A righteousness that is not based on our performance, that is based on our implicit trust in the work of redemption. And so Abraham, acted, God, God through the life of Abraham acted it out. When God told Abraham to offer his son Isaac, on their way to the place where they were to do the sacrifice, Isaac asked his father, I see the wood. I see the fire. Where is the lamb? And Abraham said something very prophetic. He said, God will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. Now, he said that in relation to the present need, to his own present need at that time. But years down the line, when Jesus showed up in John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day, the scripture says, John saw Jesus coming to him, and John cried out, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. When other men saw a man, John by the Spirit saw a lamb, the lamb that Abraham spoke about, God himself will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. And the lamb was Jesus. God moved and in Moses, the priesthood was established. Man can only 
approach God over a bleeding sacrifice. And even that was temporary. These were all types and shadows. They were types of Jesus Christ, the anti-type. And in the priesthood, Aaron, the high priest, could only access God once in a year. And he needed to do a lot of ceremony. Now, when you look at the life, the, the, the priesthood and how it was set up, when you read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 3, it says, in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance done of sin every year. The 14th verse of the same chapter says, by one sacrifice, Jesus had perfected forever those who are sanctified. Now, man had so, man had, had been disconnected from God so much so that when you read uh, 1 Samuel chapter, chapter 6, it talks about 50,070 men who were struck dead in Beth Shemesh because they saw the ark of God. Man could not approach God. Remember the story of Uzzah. When David was bringing the ark to his city, the ark was shaken in the cart and Uzzah touched the ark. He was trying to steady the ark and God struck him instantly. Man had no right standing with God. Man could not approach God. And everything we read from Genesis chapter 4 until Jesus showed up was God implementing his redemptive plan. And that brings us to the cross. What is the cross? What happened at the cross? The sacrifice of Jesus Christ was a substitutionary sacrifice. First Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the spirit. Now in the phrase, the just for the unjust, captures the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus. He took our place. He died our death. Second Corinthians 5.21 For God had made Jesus to be seen for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So we see that God made him to be seen for us. That's the emphasis. It was a substitutionary sacrifice. It was for us. He died our death. He took our place on the cross of Calvary. Now, this offer of righteousness to man was one that God would do and when he uh, is a sacrifice that God did and this sacrifice must be based on the justice of God. Romans 3.26 says, to declare at this time I say his righteousness that he, God, might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus Christ. So God becomes our righteousness, but in doing so, he needed to preserve his justice. Now, this is the wisdom of God. This righteousness is a righteousness that is based upon the principle of identification. When Adam sinned, in Adam all of the human race sinned because man, the human race, was identified with Adam's sin. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 reads, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. The 17th verse of this same chapter says, for by one man, by one man's offense, death reigned. 
much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of sacrifice shall reign in life by one man, Jesus Christ. So when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he identified with us. God made him to be seen for us. He identified with our sin. And so God is just in making the sinner righteous, a sinner who places his trust in Jesus. God becomes just in making that sinner righteous because of one sacrifice that his son offered. Remember that it was Adam who sinned. The whole human race became sinners. Now you look at that as being unfair, but by the same token, by the sacrifice of one man, Jesus Christ, whoever places his trust in Jesus Christ, by the same token, that person receives the righteousness of God. Jesus becomes his or her righteousness. Now, let's look very closely at the cross because this is where it all happened. What is the cross? The cross is a place of exchange. Second Corinthians 5.21, God made him to be seen for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. On that cross, Jesus was made sin, that we might be made righteous. It's an exchange. Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5, speaks of this same redemptive work of Jesus. And it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Now my emphasis is in the fourth verse. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Those words, grief and sorrows, are the words um, Macob and Choli or Koli as it is called in the, in the Hebrew. Those words mean sickness and pain. Interestingly, in the German Bible, because I looked it up, they preserved the original translation of those words. You have Schmerz and Krankheit, sickness and pain. Isaiah prophetically was speaking about what happened on that cross. God did not just make Jesus sin. He also took our sicknesses upon him on that cross. There was an exchange. Sickness came as a result of sin. Before the fall of man, there was no sickness. But when he fell, every kind of evil came into the world. When Jesus died on that cross, he also took our pain, our diseases, and our pain. And so when sickness attacks your body, as you go through medication, look to the cross, because there's healing for you at the cross. It was paid for. Isaiah spoke what he saw by prophecy. In 1 Peter 2.24, Isaiah looked forward to Calvary by the Spirit. In 1 Peter 2.24, after Jesus had died, Peter looks backward at Calvary and Peter says, Jesus, his own self, bore our sins in his own body on the tree, on the cross, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. He uses the past tense. And so there is healing for us in the cross. It's a place of exchange. Jesus took our sicknesses that we might receive health. Jesus took our shame on the cross. 
Jesus was stripped naked on that cross. Completely naked. His mother was the only woman that came close. The scripture says the other women stood afar off because death on the cross was a thing of shame. He took our shame that we may share in his glory. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 says, It became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. There was an exchange. Jesus died our death that we may receive his life. Jesus suffered rejection on that cross. And for the very first time, Jesus cried out to his father. And this time he didn't even call him father. He said, Eloi, Eloi, lama, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 3 says, Behold, thou art of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. You cannot look upon sin. God's eyes are pure. God cannot look upon sin with favor. And he, didn't make, he, he, he did not make an exception with his own son, Jesus. When Jesus hung on that cross and became sin, the father could no longer look upon the son of his love with favor. Rejected by men, forsaken by God, that we may gain acceptance. Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has accepted us into the beloved. We have, we have received acceptance. Ephesians 2, 13 says, now, Ephesians 2, I think, says, Now, in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off have been made nigh by the blood of Christ. There was an exchange at the cross. The cross is a very, very, that's, it's, God displayed his wisdom on the cross. The cross is God's masterpiece. We cannot improve upon it. We only receive by, by faith, what grace has made available to us. And then Jesus died, and Jesus rose again. What is the significance of, the, of, of his resurrection? Last week, Pastor Jeff told us about how it was an attest, God's attestation of his son, that he is everything he said he is. And in that resurrection, God made a public statement about Jesus Christ, about his son. In Romans 4.25, we find another truth about his resurrection. The scripture says he was delivered up for our offenses and raised again for our justification. When the claims of divine justice was met, Divine justice against man was met. God declared man discharged and acquitted. And Jesus rose again from the dead. As proof that man has been absolved of all forms of, of uh, sin leveled against him. It was God's proof. And so, the resurrection shows us that God no longer holds man's sin against him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, very famous verse of scripture. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The very next verse says, and all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself and given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, 
God was no longer holding men's sin against them. In Christ Jesus, man had been declared righteous. However, it takes his personal acceptance of that which has been done for him before it becomes a living reality in, in his life. And so, this righteousness that we're talking about is a powerful thing. It is a righteousness that is based on faith. Righteousness by faith. Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This righteousness is by faith and not by our performance. There's something I would like to talk about, which is that this righteousness is not by feeling. The scripture repeatedly lets us know in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, the just shall live by faith. We already read in Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. In Galatians 3.11, it is evident the just shall live by faith. For by the works of the law can no man be justified in the sight of God. The just shall live by faith. When you read Hebrews 10.38, it says, now the just shall live by faith. I believe that the reason why God constantly tells us that we are to live by faith is because there are days when your feelings might want be, begin to play games on you. He says the just shall live by faith, not by feelings. There are days you wake up and you don't feel like you're righteous. And you feel like you're backsliding. What do you do? It is time for you to take the scriptures and begin to look at what God has said concerning you. Our feelings are fickle. They change from time to time. The most undependable thing to build life upon is your feeling. Because they change. A person who lives by feeling, especially in, in relation to your walk with the Lord, you'd notice you're living a roller coaster life. One day you are up, the next day you are down. We are to walk by faith. What is faith? Faith is simply trusting God that He is what He said He is, taking God at His word. It is treating God like an honest being. It is believing that God meant everything he said and said everything he meant. If he says you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, whether you feel like it or you don't feel like it, it has nothing to do with your feelings. It is placing your trust in what God has said concerning you. There are days we feel like that. There are days you don't feel righteous. What do I do? I just speak the scriptures and start looking at it. What has God said concerning me? I begin to rejoice in it. Before long, the joy of God wells up on the inside of me and I start feeling good again. There is an order to it. It is faith. It, it, is, it is fact. Faith and then feeling Fact, faith, feeling. Fact is the revealed truth of God's word, what you find in the scriptures. Faith is your response to what you find in, your, in the scriptures. And then feeling is what comes. But if you are waiting to feel righteous before you believe you're righteous, then you have reversed the order. Believe everything that you find in the, in the scriptures. We are called believers. That's who we are. And we are to live by faith. Because faith is the hand that takes what grace 
has made available. Now when fellowship is broken, what happens? How is fellowship restored? In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God makes provision for fellowship to be restored. When you read 1 John chapter 1 and 1 John chapter 2, in context, you would realize that it's talking about walking in love. Any step out of love breaks fellowship with God. First John chapter 2 verse 1 says, My little children, these things I have written unto you that you do not sin. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the world. So we have someone, a man like us, even though he's fully God, who represents us before God. And every time we take our case to him, he pleads our case before the Father. And now we have a Savior who did not just die for us, but he lives for us. He's still ministering on our behalf. So when fellowship is broken, when we sin, there is provision made for fellowship to be restored. That's when you go to God and say, I have sinned. Lord, forgive me. A lot of people are still struggling with condemnation. They don't know how to handle it. The enemy keeps bringing back things that they have done five years ago, ten years ago or even last week, and he, gives, he comes with different kinds of pictures. He shows you this, he shows you that, and his whole aim is to make you self-engrossed, self-absorbed. And when you begin to look at yourself, you begin to see everything wrong with you, and you take your eyes away, from what Jesus has done for you. Because Jesus is now our righteousness. When you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you were immersed into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, By one spirit we have been baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made to drink of one spirit. We were placed in Christ. Jesus becomes our righteousness. What he did for us on the cross of Calvary, it is on that basis that God deals with us. Some people have come to a place of stagnation in their lives. Their minds are constantly assaulted with thoughts of the things they had done in the past. And they keep going to God over and over, over the same issue. How does God forgive? Romans 8, 12, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. I will remember no more. When God forgives, he doesn't remember it again. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25, it reads, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgression, and for my sake I will not remember your sins. For his own sake. And so, we need to believe God's word that he doesn't remember our sins. When you sincerely confess your sins to God, take him at his word. And every time the enemy comes with thoughts of condemnation, and he wants to make you focus on you, 
That's the time for you to speak the scriptures. Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now there is no condemnation for us. God does not condemn us because he sees us in Christ. He sees us in his son, Jesus Christ. In John chapter 16, from 7 to 11, Jesus gave a brief description of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my father, and you will, not see, me. You will see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Now, the ministry of the Holy Spirit as it relates to righteousness is what I would like to talk about now. It is that the Holy Spirit has a dual function when it comes to convicting the world of righteousness. When we go out as ambassadors of Christ, sharing the gospel, the Spirit of God brings conviction and lets the sinner know that righteousness has been offered to him by God. At that time, there's a work of the Spirit when we share the gospel, telling the, letting the people know or letting the sinner know that God has made righteousness available for you in his Son. The other side to it is in relation to the believer. The Holy Spirit constantly reminds us that we have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So that when we sin and fall short of God's glory, instead of beating ourselves down, the Spirit of God would point you to Jesus Christ and make you see the work that has been done for you. Because the scripture says, that when the Holy Spirit come, Jesus said, he will bring to your remembrance the things that I have told you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He reminds us of who we are in Christ Jesus. What is the benefit of righteousness? And how, how can we apply um, righteousness in our lives? How of what benefit is it to us? Righteousness gives you power in prayer. The thing that made Adam run away from God has been addressed in the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ. Now you are coming to your father in prayer. You can come boldly to the throne of grace. You are coming to someone who looks at you with love in his eyes. You are coming to a father who delights in you. Prayer ceases to be a struggle. Prayer becomes a delight because you know you have a father who longs to, to be with you, who longs to have fellowship with you. You can develop intimacy with him. There are, those, there are those moments when you go to the Lord and it's just you and the Lord alone. And, and heaven's bliss comes over your soul and you know you're making vital contact with your father. Those are precious moments because he longs to hear your voice. Prayer becomes the most beautiful thing in the world. Because in that place, you share something so deep and so intimate with your father. 
that anything that the world offers cannot compare to it. It pales before it. It is in what you share with your father. That's where you, you derive your, your, your sense of self-worth. Your identity, your value is in what you share with your father. Prayer becomes beautiful. And sometimes it can, be, it can really be intense. And at those moments you don't even say a word. You are just in awe of God. And it is your heart communing with your father. So you have a father who longs to talk to you, who longs to, to be with you. You are no longer running away from him like Adam did. You are longing to be with him because you have been made righteous in Christ Jesus. Righteousness is your ability to stand before the father without the feeling of inferiority, unworthiness, guilt because of what Jesus has done for you. Righteousness also empowers us in the exercise of our spiritual authority. Now, I'm not one of those persons who, who likes to see uh, a demon in everything. You know, there are people who who attribute everything to a demon. They, they, see a, they see a devil in everything. I'm not one of those people. I'm not going to give Satan cheap publicity. I choose to see God. I choose to see God in everything. However, we have an enemy. And he's real. And he, he's there to oppose us. First Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil. He points who your adversary is, points him out. Satan is your adversary. He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, whom you should resist steadfast in the faith. James 4.7, Submit to God. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. As far as the believer is concerned, Satan has been defeated. But it takes righteousness for you to exercise your authority and keep him at bay. Because every time you want to exercise your authority, Satan would, would, would tell you, but, but you've done this, but you've done that. Again, he wants you to be focused on yourself. Luke ten nineteen, Behold, I give unto you power, this is Jesus speaking, to tread upon serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Righteousness gives you boldness. I think it's Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, the, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous, they are as bold as a lion. Righteousness gives you boldness, especially this righteousness in Christ. That when Satan opposes you, you can stand in that place of righteousness in Christ Jesus and, and stand against him. You take the shield of faith you put on the breastplate of righteousness and stand against the works of the devil. Remember, it is righteousness by faith. You take the shield of faith based on God's word, putting on the breastplate of righteousness. In Revelation chapter 19, we are told of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in that account in scriptures, the eighth verse, Revelation chapter 19, verse 8, 
talks about the clothing of the believer, the marriage supper of the Lamb, when the church will be united with Christ, then we will have our glorified bodies we would have taken the same kind of body that Jesus took upon himself after he rose from the, from the dead. The eighth verse says, it was granted unto her, it was granted unto the church to be arrayed in fine linen, white and clean. And the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. That same righteousness that has been imparted into our spirits at the marriage supper of the Lamb we will be given white, fine linen, white and clean. And the Bible says that linen is the righteousness of the saints. Dressed in the righteousness of Christ Jesus, we can stand and look at the face of our lover and Lord and tell him what he means to us and tell him how much we love him. Because we are dressed, we are clothed in his righteousness. In Isaiah 61 verse 10, Isaiah, by the Spirit, captures this. And he said, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Because he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and covered me with robes of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with his ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. This is our clothing. We can be dressed in that righteousness and come before our Father. It's a blessing. It's a blessing that we have in Christ Jesus. And every one of us should be constantly reminded that in Christ, God sees you complete. Never allow the enemy make you look at yourself. Because every time you look at yourself, it no longer becomes righteousness by faith, but righteousness by your performance. Look to the cross and see what has been done for you. And appropriate its blessing in your life. Because in, the Father, because in Christ Jesus, the Father accepts you. Amen. And so, as believers, we should be conscious of this. Righteousness, consciousness. We should grow in our righteousness, consciousness in Christ Jesus. It will revolutionize our lives. And you will share something beautiful in the place of fellowship with the Lord. And it will change the way you approach God. Because you know that the Father delights in you. You are accepted by him. Not because of what you have done, but because of what his son has done for you. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we give you praise. Thank you for such love that you have bestowed upon us. And Lord, we cannot pay you for it. We can only thank you and live our lives reciprocating that love. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us in Christ Jesus. I pray, Lord, for people who are struggling with feeling of condemnation and guilt and the enemy is constantly reminding them of things they had been forgiven of. I pray for such people right now, Father. I ask that the light of truth will shine into their hearts and that freedom and liberation will come to them. I thank you, Lord. I give you praise. Help us to grow 
in this righteousness consciousness and let us become the people that you want us to be. We thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us on the cross of Calvary. We are grateful. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.